Hi, hey everybody. We're just going to do a quick audio test. If you can type yes into the chat box, if you can hear me, that would be great. Great, so I'm getting a lot of yeses and a hello from Chicago, hello. <laughs> so thank you everybody for joining our webinar today, CARES Act funding and single audits, no need to panic. Today's webinar program will be presented by Withams, Devin Desmond and Jennifer Stewart. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. Materials for today's presentation can be found in the toolbar located on the right of your screen. At the bottom of the toolbar, you will be seeing a question box. All questions pertaining to the webinar content should be asked there. We will do our best to address them. Be sure to answer all of the polling questions to ensure that you receive CPE for today's session. Once the webinar is over, there will be a pop-up asking you to complete a survey of today's session. Please take a moment to complete it. It is our way of being able to provide you with the best and most relevant programs possible. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Devin and Jen. Okay. Thanks, Ashley. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, just to you know, go through a quick bio. Um, so my name is Devin Desmond. I am a uh, senior manager here at Witham, uh, predominantly not-for-profit based out of our East Brunswick office. Um, just over 10 years now uh, with Witham. Uh, started right out of college. Uh, I went to Villanova University, so always a very exciting time for me once we get a, a little closer to March here and uh, you know the, the basketball tournament's kind of kicking up. I uh, had a rough couple last two weeks, but hopefully we can bounce back for some, some tough losses, especially over the weekend in Creighton. Uh, and then also a proud father of Chet. That's him on the left there. Uh, I'm on the right. Um, he is a cardigan uh, Welsh Corgi, four and a half, uh, but he's also a fluff. That's why uh, he has so much hair, and he sometimes gets mistaken for a border collie, uh, who's a little shorter. And I'll take over, Jen. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I know this is everyone's lunch break, so hopefully you learned something while you're eating lunch. Uh, but as Devin mentioned, um, I am Jennifer Stewart. I am an associate principal of quality control at Witham. I've actually only been here for about three months. Previously, I was with a big four for about 12 years. The majority of my time was spent um, on the not-for-profit side. And I'm also a current member of the New York State Society of CPAs Not-for-Profit Organizations Committee and look forward to talking through single audits with you today. Okay, just kind of a quick uh, quick uh, overview as to um, what we intend to accomplish today. So first we're gonna walk through and kind of um, talk about the the new uh, CARES Act funding and some, some of the new funding programs that are, are out there um, as part of basically the relief uh, act from the federal government after the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Then we're gonna get into, um, all right, if you receive any of that funding, what are the audit implications behind that? Uh, some of you may be aware of, some you may not be, depending on uh, if you're a not-for-profit or a for-profit entity. Then we're gonna get dive a little bit deeper into single audit basics and just, okay, if a single audit is required, what exactly does that mean for you as the auditee? And then finally, uh, a little bit further into audit responsibilities, right? So again, if you are a required file single audit, what uh, do you have to do on your end in order to make it a, a successful uh, experience? Okay. So diving right into CARES Act funding, um, starting off here at the top, probably with the program that most people are probably familiar with, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program or the PPP loans. Um, starting off right at the top uh, to, to note that it is not subject to single audit, um, as I mentioned, we're going to dive a little bit further into that uh, as we get further down our program here, but just um, for, for some basic understanding. So, a uh, single audit is a um, basically it's a if required for, for if an uh, entity receives certain federal funding over threshold. And uh, what that uh, audit is is then uh, just making sure that diving a little bit further into uh, the funding received. So, it's not just uh, what's getting reported, but also compliance over the award that's received. Um, so again, not just simply checking time boxes into uh, what was received and what was spent, but also how it was spent 
uh, and what are the uh, procedures in place over the program. <clears throat> um, again, uh, PPP, like I said, I think most people are probably familiar with it, but just some, some quick uh, overview of it. So um, there's a eight or 24 week uh, period that can be selected. Um, and uh, really just uh, it's to be used for costs, mainly for payroll, at least 60% of any loan amount would have to be expended for payroll in order to be forgiven. Uh, other applicable costs could be mortgage interest, rent, utility, software, uh, personal protective equipment, uh, things of that nature. Really the key thing to note uh, with the PPP program is just to ensure that costs aren't being charged twice. Uh, basically this idea of double dipping, and you'll, you'll hear us mention this probably a couple times uh, throughout the next hour or so. It's really a major, major concern of this program. Um, basically with the idea being, um, you know, reviewing your payroll cost allocation. So making sure any salaries that are being used to go ahead and apply for PPP loan forgiveness are not then being charged to the grants. Any uh, non-payroll cost allocation, same thing, they are rent, utilities, uh, things like that. Uh, if they are being used for that PPP forgiveness, make sure again that they're not being flown, um, charged through to other federal funding and there are cost pools, um, similar situation there. Fee-for-services cost reimbursements in disguise. This is probably something that um, dealing with the fee-for-service environment is maybe a question I get the most, uh, just as to um, should we really be using any of the salaries for those programs uh, for this PPP money if they are in theory being um, funded by fee-for-service billing? Uh, really kind of, a, I don't wanna say gray area from the state, but you're probably never gonna get anything in writing to say, go ahead and uh, you know do it one way or the other. Um, but, you know, I think as long as the loan was taken in good faith at the time, it would probably be, um, you know, deemed, uh, you know, able to be submitted for forgiveness. And again, yet again, no double dip. So probably the, the biggest uh, item to talk about today in terms of the PPP program uh, would be the uh, determination for financial statement presentation. And uh, basically, uh, the AICPA technical review menu uh, really allowed for three potential treatments. So the first of which would be the loan method, um, and then it would just be recorded. Basically, you know, the straight debt. This is probably what we saw the most of for any uh, 6, 30, 20 year runs. Uh, when looking at them, you know, it's basically the loan method is you go ahead and record the loan um, when the money is received. Uh, so, you know, debit, cash, credit, liability. And then uh, you're going to be accruing any interest as needed uh, throughout the loan period. And then once uh, the loan is applied for forgiveness and that forgiveness is approved, then go ahead and record uh, revenue for the um, debt forgiveness, basically to clear off the loan amount and any accrued interest. Uh, then um, for for-profit entities, they have the ability to go ahead and record it as a government grant under IAS 20. And basically what this would just be is that, um, you know, any funds received would be recorded as deferred uh, revenue up until the point that um, these costs are, are actually paid using those funds. And then those um, flowing through the P&L could be either shown as other income or as a reduction of the um, expenses that were being accumulated for forgiveness. And then finally, for any not-for-profits out there, um, also has the ability to show it as a government grant, which would really fall into you know, conditional contributions with the idea again there being uh, be showed as deferred revenue up until the point that the conditions were met. Um, such that uh, the expenses are, are paid for using the funds, um, as which point it would be taken into income. Uh, but again, here, it can only be shown as other income. We can't uh, offset the expenses from there. It also gives rise to the uh, need to, within the functional expenses, make sure any uh, PPP funded uh, expenses, if we're choosing to show it this way, um, are separated accordingly and shown um, under um, being uh, applied for, for reimbursement under PPP. Sorry, forgiveness, okay? <clears throat> the next program uh, would be the uh, Economic Injury Disaster Loans or the EDIL loans, EIDL loans, sorry. Um, these are actually subject to single audit under CFDA 59008. Um, some considerations, I mean, there are more narrowable uses than traditional federal programs. It's basically, it's, it's to fund working capital needs um, under um, basically a coronavirus emergency um, purpose. So, you know, operating expenses being things like healthcare, rent, utilities, fixed debt payments, um, can't refinance other loans with it, but really can kind of be used to, to keep any organizations that were impacted by coronavirus afloat. And obviously, again, here, same cost can't be used for both PPP and EIDL purposes or any other governmental work. Again, that general idea of no double dipping. 
the next major stream of funding that uh, came out from the CARES Act would be the HHS uh, Provider Relief Funds, or PRF money. And this, again, is uh, applicable to single audit under 93.498. Uh, um, for any for-profit entities out there that are receiving this funding, um, there is the there are options for reporting, um, two options, basically. It would either be the single audit, which we're going to dive into further, or a, a GAGUS a financial audit of all HHS awards um, for the period. Um, and why we're going to dive further into single audit on, on this particular webinar is the GAGUS option is really just kind of, there's a lot of questions still out there uh, surrounding the, the, the um, basically the reporting model itself and how it would work. Uh, the AICPA has a number of questions out to AHS, uh, HHS that have not been responded to as of uh, current writing. So it's really just a lot of questions out there. So that's why um, we wanted to try and get ahead of this to, to any uh, clients or potential clients out there. Just note that if you are receiving this funding, um, the option out there is for the single audit, including a program-specific audit option, which is really, again, we'll get into a little bit further down the road, um, but that's probably the one that's going to be a little bit clearer and we can you know, speak in more definitive terms as to what exactly you would have to do as the auditee. Um, these funds were provided to hospitals and other healthcare providers, basically really anyone who was um, billing Medicaid uh, during the period of uh, really uh, 2020. Um, and it's really to support healthcare uh, related expenses or loss revenue attributed uh, to, to COVID-19. We'll get into a little bit further detail next. So the funding for this uh, came through three, three phases. The first of which was distributed in April of 2020. So that was basically 30 billion for anyone who would build uh, Medicaid fee-for-service in 2019. I think that was the, the kind of 2% uh, number that basically they're making sure that you were at least getting 2% of what you had built in the previous year. Next was uh, an additional 20 billion um, for anyone who was uh, basically reporting off of cost report data. Phase two uh, was made available um, in June of 2020. There's another 18 billion, uh, and that kind of expanded the program to really get into Medicaid billing as well as uh, dental and other programs. I think uh, nursing homes were, were available at that time as well. And then finally, phase three uh, was uh, made available in October of 2020. And this really uh, was for basically uh, assisted living, behavioral health, uh, any other providers that are previously, uh, previously ineligible. And then uh, also phase three was opened up to anyone who had received money in the first two phases as well. They could go ahead and reapply if additional losses were incurred. <clears throat> so what can these PRF funds be used for? Um, so basically the, 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 the first and probably easiest uh, ones to grasp would just really be Healthcare related expenses, um, which have not been reimbursed or obligated to be reimbursed by another source, uh, falling under this would really be things like GNA costs, so any mortgage or rent um, for facilities that are providing services relating to COVID 19. Uh, insurance, basically any property insurance or even uh, malpractice insurance. Again, uh, with the idea being that it would have to be anything above and over the original amount spent, it's really just focusing on any effort really to um, basically respond to, uh, prevent and protect people from COVID-19. Uh, personnel costs, um, that being really the uh, additional um, funding for, you know, if you need any additional temp staffing, any training on how to um, properly protect against the virus up and above normal uh, costs incurred. Fringe amounts, and then again, utilities. Uh, healthcare related uh, so, uh, expenses outside of GNA, so things like additional supplies, PPE, uh, additional equipment such as ventilators or HVAC improvements, IT facilities costs. Um, and again, anything not spent on the above could be uh, used uh, for lost revenue attributed to, to COVID-19. And with that, there's there's three options to report that. Um, so the first and probably most easy to understand would be just the difference between the 2019 and 2020 actual patient care revenues. So just comparing what was billed in 2020 versus 2019. Um, you also have the option to go ahead and uh, use the budget amount, so difference between uh, what 2020 budget was going to be and 2020 actual patient care, provided that the budget was actually approved um, prior to March 27th of 2020. And then finally, uh, you can go ahead and attempt to use the alternate reasonable methodology of estimating lost revenue, but uh, right in the uh, HHS uh, kind of reporting guidelines, uh, they are kind of questioning, uh, basically letting you know that if you are using this third option, be prepared to have uh, required documentation and it's going to definitely be more uh, scrutinized 
and reviewed. Okay. And then just to talk about some, some other programs here. Um, first off would be the Coronavirus Relief Fund, uh, and that's funded under CFDA 21.019. Um, basically, it's it's really targeted towards government entities. There were some um, uh, entities that went ahead and passed this down to, to for-profits, but uh, really kind of outside the scope of, I believe, anyone on this call. Then we have the Education Stabilization Fund. This uh, was targeted to higher education schools and states. Uh, the interesting about about this particular um, fund, you know, being funded under 84.425 on the CFTA, was that uh, also letters were added to the basic CFTA. Um, so a while, and again, Jen will get a little bit further into how this all works in terms of what's a federal program versus a federal award. But basically, anything funded under the same CFDA code should really be looked at um, kind of as as one you know major program. But uh, within these letters that were added to this program, there's actually subsections of the compliance addendum. So depending on what letter of your funding depends on what procedures you have to do over that uh, funding received. Okay. And then uh, there were some other grants provided by FEMA and the National Endowment on the Humanities. And I think with that, it's our time for our first poem question. Great. All right, we're launching the first poem question. Make sure to get those answers in. Uh, if you're struggling with clicking on the answer for whatever the reason, we've had this happen occasionally in the past, just pull your screen out of full screen mode and that should work. All right, we'll just give it another few seconds before closing it out. Get those votes in. How's the response rate looking? So far, 72% have voted. And I see a lot of people are voting for all of the above so far. So I'm going to close it out and we'll see what those answers look like. So 5% voted for GNA expenses, 12% healthcare related expenses, 4% lost revenue attributable to COVID, and a whole 79% voted for all of the above. Yep, and I would say the majority is correct there. Uh, you can go ahead and, and use that, that funding for, for any of the, the three above uh, items, so good job. Okay. So next, we're just gonna, you know, basically dive a little bit deeper into. Okay, so if you received any of that preceding funding, you know, why, why would, why does this matter? Like, what, what's the next step here? Like, yes, I received it. So, um, really, any organization that receives the preceding federal funding could be subject um, to audit under uh, governmental auditing standards, also known as GAGAS, and/or a uniform guidance based on the level of funding received. Um, so that that uniform um, guidance really is triggered um, on the baseline of $750,000. So any amount received over that would go ahead and trigger the need for some uh, audit to be performed under uniform guidance. Um, and I guess this is kind of what people may not be aware of, depending on your organization, but it would include for-profit organizations. Um, as they, um, HHS says under um, 45 CFR 75 dash, uh, sorry, dot 216, that uh, any uh, entity receiving, um, and basically really be targeted towards the PRF funds, um, receiving those funds over 750,000 would be required to go ahead and have a single audit or a program specific audit or uh, some sort of additional financial reporting under Agus. And so that can include hospitals, physician groups, um, behavioral health providers, assisted living facilities, et cetera. And so just an additional word, so basically what is Gagas? Um, some of you may be familiar with the term yellow book. Um, that's because uh, these auditing standards used to be, I guess, technically still are. If you get a paper copy printed in a book with a bright yellow cover. So it just basically kind of went ahead and that's, you know, where the name came from. We're accountants. We're not very, you know, inventive at times. Um, these, it's basically a set of audit regulations that must be followed when a non-governmental organization that receives governmental funds is being audited. 
And it goes beyond our normal auditing standards, otherwise known as uh, gas there, um, by requiring basically reporting over the consideration of internal controls. So it's not just that the um, financial statements presented are free of material in this statement, but also we have to go ahead and, and do some additional procedures over the internal controls of the entity. And uh, just kind of uh, how the interplay works here, um, all single audits are under GAGIS, but not all un audits under GAGIS are single audits. So again, it's that kind of level, tiered level of cake where you'd have a gas audit at the bottom, GAGIS in the middle, and then a single audit up on the top. Okay. And again, so why does this matter? So basically, if you received over $750,000 of uh, some of these funds that we had talked about earlier, uh, your organization would be subject to either a single audit or a program specific audit. Um, why does it matter? Um, obviously, as anyone can expect, um, any higher level of assurance that has to be provided really does put stress on available resources necessary to complete those audits in a timely um, time frame. Um, there's also increased risk for organizations who have basically not been through a, a governmental audit uh, prior due to the level of documentation required uh, to be provided. And then uh, current accounts and auditors just very well may not be able to perform these audits. Um, rest assured, anyone uh, with, with them, uh, we do have an experienced team in place. We do a lot of these audits and, and have the knowledge required for it. But again, any smaller firms uh, is really where you see um, basically some, some lacking um, on, on their end to be able to perform them because there's basically uh, in the back end uh, minimum levels of CPE that must be obtained and basically just has to be familiar with how to efficiently um, complete these. And finally, additional reporting requirements. So besides just providing numbers on a financial statement, there's also potential for statements of findings and question costs and um, any other um, items that may be found as part of uh, additional audit procedures. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jen, who's gonna dive a little bit further into single audit basics. Thanks, Devin. So as Devin mentioned, Non-federal entities have two options, a full single audit or a program-specific audit. Both are acceptable under uniform guidance. So first we're gonna talk about the single audit. The federal government passed the Single Audit Act of 1984, which was later amended in 1996. It's called the single audit because it actually consolidates multiple awards into a single audit instead of multiple audits. And that was done to improve not only the effectiveness of the audit, but also reduce the burden on organizations. The authoritative guidance is known as the uniform guidance and that is issued by the Office of Management and Budget. The most recent regulations include not only the cost principles, but also the audit requirements for non-federal entities. So what exactly is a non-federal entity? A non-federal entity includes all of the following that carry out federal awards as either a recipient of those awards or a subrecipient of those awards. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But it includes state and local governments, not-for-profits, Indian tribes, and higher education organizations. Another thing to keep in mind, when an auditee is not technically covered under uniform guidance, that would include for-profit entities, the pass-through entity is responsible for establishing the requirements to ensure that for-profit entity is in compliance. So if you receive an award, and you pass a part of that award onto a for-profit subrecipient, you're still responsible for making sure that that for-profit subrecipient is in compliance with uniform guidance. So as we talked about earlier, for-profit organizations are not included under this umbrella of non-federal entity. However, HHS does require an audit either under single audit um, or under the GAGAS financial option, um, especially for the PRF funding. So just a little background on what gives HHS that authority to require for-profits to have an audit of PRF funding. Those rules Devin mentioned are in 45 CFR part 75. And although it's not a single audit requirement specifically like not-for-profits, there is subpart F audit requirements within 
section um, 75 that really lends itself to having a single audit or this financial audit. So we'll talk a little bit about that um, additionally later, but just for entities that are commercial organizations or for, or for profits, basically one in the same, uh, that receive HHS awards under PRF funding, you will have those two options. And as Devin did mention, there really isn't, there are a lot of questions uh, surrounding the Gagas financial audit option right now. Um, so we won't really be focusing on that, but something important to note is that is an option for for-profit organizations. There are some other CFDAs just to be aware that are subject to audit, um, including PRF. That include the COVID-19 testing for the uninsured and COVID-19 testing for rural health clinics that also fall under HHS funding. So if additional awards are received as well from HHS, just be mindful that all those awards are subject to audit. Okay. So the next slide, what is a federal award? It's federal financial assistance received directly from a federal awarding agency. So anything the organization receives straight from the federal government, or it can also be received indirectly via a pass-through entity, also known as a PTE for short. This can include grants, contracts, cooperative agreements, direct appropriation, loan and loan guarantees, and even endowments. So you won't always see a federal award as a grant agreement, although that may be one of the more prevalent forms. So just be aware of that when you are looking at the totality of your federal awards. So what is a federal program? A federal program includes federal awards that are assigned a number in accordance with the assistance listing. That number is known as a CFDA number or a catalog of federal domestic assistance number. It's essentially a five digit code that's assigned to all federal assistance. The first two numbers include the federal department. So as Devin mentioned earlier, for example, 93 is HHS, 84, for example, is the US Department of Education. So that indicates first the federal department. And then secondly, there's a three digit suffix that relates to the specific program. So you'll see those digits changing depending on the specific program that CFDA is assigned. In addition, there are certain instances where there are a cluster of programs, and that is essentially a group of closely related programs that share similar common compliance requirements. We'll talk about compliance requirements in a little bit, but part five of uh, the compliance supplement does include a listing of those clusters. Most notably, you may have seen student financial aid and research and development are some of the common clusters that you may have seen in the past. The compliance supplement in and of itself is essentially identifying all the existing compliance requirements subject to audit based on that program. So it's a great source of information. If you haven't looked at it, I would suggest taking a look at it. We have a slide at the end of the presentation that has a link to the latest version of the compliance supplement, in addition to the addendum that was released, which includes the specific COVID-19 programs. And that's really the auditor's tool to understand each of the federal program's objectives, the procedures and the compliance requirements. So it does include audit objectives as well, in addition to suggested audit procedures. So it's a great tool. I would suggest taking a look, especially if you know that you've received federal funding under a COVID-19 program that may be subject to audit. So, there are a couple questions that we're gonna walk through to really determine whether or not a single audit is applicable. And considering this, the first question is really, have you received financial assistance during the year? Yeah, and you really need to consider the entirety of all of your funding. So 
again, as I mentioned, it can be in the form of grants, contracts, loans, non-cash, including donated property. And especially in these times, it can be a little bit challenging because there may not necessarily be that signed document because we are now in a virtual world. So please make sure that you're considering all of your funding. Take a look at your revenue first. That's probably a good place to start and see how, are any of those funds received from an organization, federal organization, state organization, and what is the form of those funds? The next question focuses on the source of the funding. So what is the original source of the funding? Is it federally funded? Is it state funded? And one thing to really be aware of is there are times when you may receive funding, but it's passed through another entity. So for example, if you receive funding from the state of New Jersey, that funding may have originated from the federal government. So you need to be mindful that there could be federal funding hidden, if you will, in some of that pass-through funding. So again, make sure you know what the original source of the fund funding is. And if you aren't, if it's not clear and you're not aware of what that original source is, then talk to the organization that passed through that funding to you. So once we've gone through the first two questions, the next question is, are there expenditures during the current year related to the federal and state financial assistance? And one of the questions that comes up is, well, when does a federal ex expenditure actually occur? The general answer is when the activity related to the federal award occurs. So it, it may not necessarily be tied to gap recognition of revenue. For example, for expenses, those transactions related to the contract when they're expensed, that is when the, the underlying activity occurs. However, there are certain situations where funding is passed through to subrecipients. In that scenario, the disbursement being made to the subrecipient is actually when the expenditure occurs. So it's really a cash basis, if you will, in that situation. So again, there could be a variety of transactions that occur related to your grants and contracts. Chapter seven of the Government Auditing Standards and Single Audit Guide actually has tables that have really good information on when the expenditure occurs, depending on what that item is. For example, loans, expenses, disbursements related to subrecipients, et cetera. So that could be a really good guide if you're not sure. There are also some tables there that include the basis for valuing those awards. So again, if you're if you have different forms of funding, that would be a good resource to check. The new COVID-19 programs are introducing a bit of a challenge to the normal process. In certain situations, cash may be received in advance of the agreement um, or agreeing to the terms and conditions of the of the award. So just be aware of that. And then we do have this lost revenue concept which is currently an open question. And that's really because the guidance, as you've seen, says expenditures um, related to federal awards, but there is language related to HHS funding that mentions receipts. So again, that's an open question, but um, just be mindful that um, there will be some forthcoming guidance from the AICPA specific to PRF. And Devin mentioned this and stole my thunder a little bit, but there is a $750,000 threshold. So the last question would be, does the total dollar of your federal and or state assistance equal or exceed that threshold? That would also include pass-through funding, so don't forget about that. And Again, it is based on expenditures rather than receipts. So if all of the answers to all of those questions were yes, especially the last question, 
you would need a single audit under either federal requirements, which we mentioned is the uniform guidance or state requirements. So if you have state of New Jersey funding that would fall under the Department of Treasury circular, which is 1508 OMB. If your last question was no, but you do have more than $100,000 in New Jersey state financial assistance, you may be required to have a financial statement audit in accordance with GAGIS. One other thing I just wanted to mention, if you do have funding from the New Jersey Department of Human Services, they don't differentiate between the requirements of a single audit under 1508 OMB, which is the state of New Jersey's OMB, between a not-for-profit state and local government or a for-profit entity. So, whereas a for-profit entity is not covered under uniform guidance or 1508 OMB, and could have a program specific audit, which we'll talk about shortly, New Jersey Department of Human Services would require a single audit under 1508 OMB. So said differently, a for-profit entity that receives 750,000 or more from New Jersey Department of Human Services would be required to have a single audit under the requirements of the state of New Jersey. So something to be aware of if you do receive funding from the New Jersey Department of Human Services. So the scope of the single audit. The audit encompasses an audit of the financial statements, which is in accordance with AICPA standards or GAS and government auditing standards, also known as Yellow Book or GAGAS. It can be under GAP or a special purpose framework. It also must cover the entire operations of the organization. So generally, if there are consolidated level financial statements, you would start with that for what should be looked at at its entirety as a single entity. There is an option to look at subsidiaries individually and have a series of single audits as well. It also includes uh, audit of compliance in accordance with GAS and uniform guidance. And once the audit is complete, it is required to be submitted to the Federal Audit Clearinghouse within 30 days of the release of the audit report date or nine months after fiscal year end, whichever is earlier. So just be mindful of that. I know some people think, okay, the audit's done. I have nine months after year end, but there is that other 30 day requirement if that is the earlier of the two. The auditor will provide an audit opinion on the financial statements and whether they're presented fairly in all material respects under GAAP or a special purpose framework. They'll also determine whether the CFA or the schedule of expenditures of federal awards, which we'll talk about shortly as well, is fairly stated in all material respects in relation to the financial statements as a whole. So that's in a relation to opinion versus the actual financial statement opinion. It's a little bit lower level assurance than the financial statement opinion. We, the auditor will also understand the internal control over the federal programs and plan the audit to support a low assessed level of control risk of non-compliance for any major programs and then test internal controls over compliance. And as I mentioned, the auditor uses the OMB compliance supplement to perform the audit. The compliance testing that's performed also includes tests of transactions and other procedures necessary to provide the auditor with sufficient appropriate audit evidence to support an opinion on compliance. And any deficiencies that are, are identified in internal control that were deemed to be material weaknesses or significant deficiencies will be reported as well. And lastly, any other findings related to compliance will be reported in addition to if you've had a single audit in the past and there are prior year audit findings, there will be a follow-up or a status update on those. So regarding the findings, the auditee is required to prepare a corrective action plan separate from the auditor's findings to address any and all findings that have been identified and uh, would also include a status of prior year findings if if those were applicable. All right, so we mentioned single audit. 
Um, I won't go over what a single audit is. I think we've covered that. But um, just to note on here, it is required typically if you do have more than one source of funding. We've mentioned this program specific audit option under uniform guidance as well. And that really encompasses the compliance piece of the, um, of the, the audit. So it's really just the audit of the compliance over those programs. It does not include a financial statement audit. So if there is a financial statement audit requirement, then this option cannot be utilized. And it also can't be utilized typically if federal funding is expended for more than one program. So for non-federal entities, remember not-for-profits, when there is expending of awards on, on, under only one federal program or a cluster for the same program, excluding research and development, because there are certain criteria around those that, that cluster specifically. Um, and the federal laws, regulations, or grant agreements don't require a financial statement audit. This is a great option to elect. And that would be in accordance with Section 707, program-specific audits of the uniform guidance. And that will take us to our next polling question. Great. So polling question number two. For a calendar year end, when is a single audit due? And again, same as I said the first time, just make sure to get your answers in for these polling questions. It will ensure your CPE credit for the day. And just so our presenters know, Jen and Devin, we do have a few questions that came in, so we can answer those at the end. Or if you'd like to hear one of them now, let me know, I can read it. Let's keep them to the end, Ashley, just in case we cover something. Perfect. All right, we're just going to close out the polling question in just another two seconds. All right, we're closing it out. All right, so we have 58% that says September 30th of the following year. The earlier of the two above, whenever I get to it, um, I think we were, might have been missing a piece of this but um, as I mentioned if if you do have an audit that's performed and you have the report issued um, with let's say for example for 1231 you issue your report in March for argument's sake March 30th you would have to report within 30 days of that report date. So you cannot wait until September 30th. You can't default to that nine month deadline. So just be aware of that. If you do, that would be a finding potentially. So I'll say potentially, <laughs> but um, it typically is. So I know a lot of audits end up taking right up sometimes till the very last minute of that nine month window. So typically the 30 day, period is not applicable. But if you have that report issued prior to um, waiting till the last minute, you do have that 30 day deadline. So just be aware of that. All right. So auditee responsibilities. So before I dive into the auditee requirements, in general, it probably would be a good idea if possible to designate someone in your organization who's familiar with the grant and the requirements of the grant if you've received federal funding. They can be extensive and you really don't want anything to be missed that could result in a finding. So having that person really be the go-to person that's familiar with the requirements will be extremely helpful. So the requirements of the auditees are included within subpart D in the uniform guidance. 
that includes the standards for financial management. So take a look there for some additional information, but some of the highlights in terms of what's required of auditees. First, auditees must follow all requirements of the award. The actual award can come in a variety of forms. So for example, a grant agreement, a contract, uniform guidance, it could reference the Code of Federal Regulations, also known as the codification. So it's very important that you read that award letter or agreement or whatever you have and make sure if it's referred to other guidance within that agreement that you're aware of what those requirements are because that will be the auditee's responsibility. Auditees are also responsible for maintaining internal control over federal programs, and Devin will touch upon that shortly. In addition, the auditee should have a good system for performance me measurement that includes tracking and reporting on grant activities, and that's really to demonstrate that you are achieving the objectives of the award. In addition, your financial management system should be adequate and operating which we'll talk about in the next few slides. In addition, written policies should be documented in writing. That would include internal controls. And it's really a best practice to have documented policies and procedures in place really for all the compliance requirements. And we'll touch on those requirements in the next few slides. But there are certain policies that are required to be documented in accordance with uniform guidance. We'll touch on those in a, in a minute. Auditees are also required to prepare a schedule of expenditures of federal awards. So we mentioned this earlier. This is also known as the CIFA. And the CIFA includes the period covered by the auditee's financial statements. So it may be for a fiscal year, for example, the year ended June 30, or it can be a calendar year. And essentially the CIFA really provides a snapshot of all the federal awards expended during that period. It contains a variety of elements. So it has the name of the federal grantor, the title of the program, whether it's a direct award, which is an award received directly from the funding source, or if it's an indirect award that's passed through from another entity. It includes a CFTA number, the pass-through entity identifying number, if it's a pass-through award, if it's applicable, the total amount that's provided to subrecipients. So again, if your organization took funding and passed that funding to other organizations, that total dollar amount would be included. And again, that would be on a cash basis since amounts are included on the CIFA when they are paid to subrecipients. And finally, the total expenditures for that program. In addition, the auditee is responsible for arranging for a single audit and ensuring it's properly performed and timely submitted. Remember, we just talked about the earlier of 30 days of the audit report or nine months after year end. If noncompliance is identified, the auditee must take prompt action and respond to any findings identified by the auditor. They must prepare a corrective action plan. In addition, they are also responsible for, for preparing certain sections of the data collection form. And the data collection form is, is basically a summary of the results of the single audit. There are certain parts that are prepared by the auditee and the auditor, and that's ultimately what gets submitted to the Federal Audit Clearinghouse. So I touched on award requirements a little earlier in this section. But typically, you will see what those requirements are in the grant agreement or contract, and that will be supplemented by the compliance supplement. So one piece of the requirements include the specific compliance requirements that are discussed in detail within the supplement. Um, and as I mentioned, there is a link to the latest version of the supplement and the addendum at the end of this slide. There are a total of 12 of them, as you can see. Only certain ones most likely will be applicable to the specific federal program. So those compliance requirements are also called direct and material. And the compliance supplement 
contains a listing of CFDA numbers and which compliance requirements would be relevant to your program. So for those direct and material compliance requirements, we've been seeing for the COVID-19 programs, typically activities allowed and unallowed, allowable cost, cost principles, in addition to eligibility and reporting. So you could see there's 12 here, but only four or potentially three or more, depending on the program, may be applicable. And again, the compliance supplement is a great, great source of information. It provides a lot of detail on what, what procedures will be performed by the auditor and what those, those objectives are related um, to those audit for each of those compliance requirements. A couple notes on allowable costs. So any allowable costs that are charged to the grant must be necessary and reasonable for performing the award. They should be consistent with policies and procedures that apply uniformly, both to federally financed awards and other activities of the non-federal entity. And there should be adequate documentation as to what the cost was for and that it's allowable. Some federal grants not only have direct costs, but also have overhead costs, which are, is also known as indirect costs. So there may be a negotiated rate that you have with uh, the federal government as to what percent you could use for indirect costs. In some cases, there's an option to use a de minimis rate of 10%. Uh, one last note on compensation. If you have amounts for personnel, salaries and benefits, that also needs to be reasonable and documented, and it cannot be based on budgeted amounts. So if you have individuals working on multiple grants and you're allocating those amounts based on budgeted time, that should not be the final charge to the grant. It needs to be based on actual time charged. And a lot of organizations may use a time and effort reporting system to track that time. Uh, but again, just a reminder, cannot be based on budget amounts. It has to be the actual time an individual worked on that grant. Regarding financial systems, so you must be able to identify and track separately federal awards. That doesn't just mean if you have revenue accounts in the trial balance that you're tracking it that way, you actually need to keep your spending tracked separately. The systems have to produce complete and accurate financial records, so you need good financial data. There should be support for any drawing of amounts that you've drawn down from the federal government, how much you need, when you need it. Um, sometimes you might just be receiving it, so it might be pushed to you, but in may, many cases you'll have to request it and that request needs to be supported. And there should be effective internal control over the grants that are administered, um, which Devin will touch on in a little bit. We mentioned, I mentioned written procedures. So again, best practice is to have written policies for all compliance areas, but there are specific areas where they're required for uniform guidance. The first is a written policy on how you determine how much to draw down. So that's the amount you're gonna be requesting from the funding source, your cash. The next is a formal policy on the process that you, your organization uses to make purchases. So to procure items, which also includes uh, not allowing conflicts of interest. There should be a policy on allowability of costs. If you have personnel costs, there should be written policy on compensation, so salaries and benefits. And one other item that's not listed here um, <laughs> that may not be too much uh, happening during this time, but there um, should also be a policy for travel costs as well. So where do we start? Reach out to your current auditors if you've received new funding and make sure that they have the ability to perform the audit. Selecting an auditor must also follow procurement standards. And for non-federal entities, that means 
following your own policy first and foremost. So if you have a threshold, for example, to obtain bids over $1,000, then you need to follow that policy, even if the guidance requires bids over $5,000, let's say, for example. Um, you should have a formal policy that doesn't allow conflict of interest in the procurement process. You should always consider the most economical purchase option. That's not necessarily the cheapest option, but it's the best overall value. It should be reasonable and necessary and provide full and open competition. So just keep that in mind when you are selecting an auditor, it needs to follow those standards. The auditor is required to provide a peer review report under Yellow Book with limits services provided so that the auditor can remain independent. We talked about preparing the draft CIFA. So again, inventory what you have, talk to your auditor if you have questions um, and begin your documentation if you haven't already, hopefully you have, but again, for those key areas where you need written procedures, make sure you start documenting those in writing. If you have things digitally, um, make sure you have aggregated them have available all your grant agreements, award letters, contracts, anything you've submitted in terms of reports and any documentation for your transactions. And like I said, if you have any questions, please reach out to your auditor. And with that, we'll go to our third polling question. All right, polling question three is launched. Which of the following is not a key area for award compliance? And then after this one, we just have one more polling question. So again, make sure to get those votes in for your CPE credit today. All right, how are we looking? We have just about 60% votes, so we'll wait another few seconds and then we'll close out. All right, make sure you answer to get your CPE. All right, and we're going to close out. All right, the answer is accountability, 59%. Very good. All right, I'm gonna throw back to Devin to wrap it up. Okay, thanks Jim. All right, so uh, kind of just gonna say, just gonna run briefly through um, some aspects of internal controls. Um, basically, uh, I think you kind of made it clear, so it's really on the audity to to establish and maintain effective internal controls um, for all federal awards. Um, and basically need to just, you know, provide that reasonable insurance that they're managing the award in compliance with all statutes and regulations uh, of the award. And as you um, also mentioned, you know, part six of the OMB compliance um, supplement is really kind of a good place to start if you don't really know where to. Kind of gives you a summary of the requirements under uniform guidance, some background uh, discussion on important topics, and, uh, and that has dependencies with some uh, sample uh, controls and disclosures. All right. Um, so when it comes to internal controls, um, it's really important um, that the the auditee and the auditor really assess both the entity-wide and program-specific controls across the following. And when you kind of look at this list here, it's really kind of a, a top-down approach, right? So the control environment being really the the more broad idea, of, you know, really just kind of set of standards of the overall organization. This is kind of where you get into that tone up the top mentality and just uh, kind of looking at ethics across the board and, and that sort of thing. Uh, information communication, um, that's just kind of the key to the constant dialogue between departments and, and levels of the organization to make sure that uh, any necessary information is, is getting to the people that need it. Risk assessment, this is something that should be kind of ongoing and dynamic uh, for the entity, really going all the way from, from management up and to the board level as well. Just noting that uh, any potential, you know, risk or, or events are, are constantly being monitored and, and, and thought um, about basically what could happen, right? Uh, the next area then would be monitoring. So again, just kind of once any risks are assessed, making sure that nothing, no events have actually occurred. And then control activities, probably the, the most granular level. So so that's really the, the actions and the procedures established, right? So that's really what we're saying 
uh, should be and needs to be documented uh, over any uh, federal funding and, and federal awards. Okay. Uh, some key considerations, just wanted to kind of throw this out there, even for people that maybe have been familiar with single audits in the past. It's just uh, noting that things probably have changed in the past year, um, maybe since the last time you had an audit completed. And really, you know, just making sure that you have documented and also, you know, either let your auditor know if you've been through one already or just, you know, for your own edification. You know, when did processes change? What changed? Were there new systems implemented? Um, did you go to, you know, a full digital system so you're no longer on paper and filing um, using, you know, electronic bill payments or things like that? Um, how are transactions approved? You know, we're seeing a lot of things move to email. You know, is that properly documented within your controls? How are checks cut and signed? Uh, you know, you're hearing weird stories about basically people meeting in parks and trading briefcases uh, just to have checks, you know, properly cut and signed because they need uh, two signatures and then the check printer might be uh, just under, still in the office that only one person's going to. Um, so it's really just making sure that um, you kind of look back over the past year review your procedures, what's changed, and making sure you have documented, and basically just, just let anyone know. Um, you know, we always do our standard inquiries as to any new controls in there, but sometimes things like this, if it becomes new normal, might, might slip people's minds. Some other uh, key internal control consideration in the new COVID environment, um, just, you know, making sure you have established policies for things like new debt and or grants. Um, you know, things like PPP and EIDL really are technically debt, so, making sure that all proper um, approvals were, were um, followed by the organization before those agreements were entered into. Uh, payroll tax deferrals, just kind of noting that if uh, things are getting deferred, it may eventually roll up to the um, board level if they're not eventually remitted timely. Uh, risk assessment practices, again, always just kind of a, a best practice for any management or board, um, just kind of, you know, when's the last time it's been performed, is that something the organization's even thinking of? And, you know, think of both financial risk, um, you know, what's the chance everything could shut down again and reputational risk. That's really more on the cyber side as to um, can that something get out that we don't want to get out. And then finally, budgeting approach, again, just making sure that budgets are uh, approved timely. Um, obviously, that's going to be key for uh, PRF with looking back on lost revenue. And then finally, uh, just really touched on, on um, you know, some things that, that Jen had already spoken about, but there are expanded uh, controls for related to allowable costs, just making sure that, you know, um, were, were these costs necessary to, to be held anyway um, in the first place for the funding? Um, and so that not submitted uh, otherwise and, and deemed unallowable. Um, and again, potential for unallowable costs, again, getting back to the whole double dipping and anytime we can drop in a Seinfeld reference, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and hop over to the fourth polling question. Great. Fourth polling question is launched. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, my organization's internal controls have changed significantly, somewhat significantly, not significantly, or what are internal controls? And this will be the last polling question of the session today. So this is the last time I will say, get those votes in. Alrighty, and two more seconds and I'm going to close it out. Yeah, this was really just to get a pulse on yep. how it's looking for everyone, so. Okay, I'm glad no one answered what are internal controls. <laughs> Never be too sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, I know we're a little over, Ashley, but um, if you want to throw out some of those questions we'll leave the resources slide up for you it's also in the in the handout as well yeah great so if anybody chooses to log off just make sure to answer that survey um, before you totally close out um, and for anybody who wants to stay on we just have a few questions so I'll read them them off so the first one that came in um, in a case where a for-profit audit has already commenced and has a quick reporting tight. Example, March 30th. Is it, a, is it an option to release the F's audit 
then complete a separate program specific audit afterwards. So if I'm understanding, they've already pretty much completed their financial statement audit. And then the question is, this is for for-profit, right? If they can do a program specific audit separately, it seems like you could, it seems like that would be an option. Um, it, depending on the circumstance, but it, th that could be one of the options in accordance with the HHS funding for PRF. Um, it, because you have your program specific option you and you have your financial statement op already completed um, because you essentially don't need the financial statement audit, uh, that would probably be the easiest way. And I, I think a lot of for-profit entities that did receive PRF funding will go this route or will go the GAGAS financial audit route, but yes, that, that would be an option. All right. The second one is, if one of our subsidiaries received funds that require they have a single audit, does our parent company or other subsidiaries need to be audited as well? So typically, Devin, I don't know if you wanted to take some of these, but I could take um, this one. I, typically, you would start with consolidated financial statements. Um, if you chose the single audit option, um, like I said, versus program specific where you wouldn't need the financial statement audit. But if you're choosing the single audit option, um, and, and again, this is for nonprofit uh, organization. So if it's a for-profit with subsidiaries, this um, this could be an option for PRF funding. I'm assuming it's PRF funding specifically. Um, but again, uh, if it's for-profit and it, it's not PRF funding, this wouldn't apply necessarily. Um, so I'm making a couple of assumptions here. <laughs> um, but you could have it at a consolidated level um, typically, you would start there. You could have it at the subsidiary level as well. Um, I think it's just going to depend on the situation. So some of this might be situational, and without knowing all the information, it's a little bit hard to answer. Um, but but I would say talk to your auditor um, and see what your funding is and what your options are, um, because it may not necessarily make sense to have a single audit if you can have a program specific audit, right? Um, and just go the compliance route. So again, I, I, there, I know that's not really answering the question, but I think it just depends on the situation and the funding, et cetera. So I'd probably need a little bit more information. All right, yeah. And anybody on the call who wants to follow up with our presenters afterwards can definitely reach out as well. Yes. Um, so we have two more questions that came through. Um, the third is, is there any guidance for determining lost revenues under PRF where programs funding streams were added during 2019? A comparison of 2019 to 2020 revenues from patient care will result in an increase in revenue due to extended programs, even though there was a lost revenue in 2020. Yeah, so I, I think, and we were getting kind of a lot of the questions for that. I think that's kind of where they were trying to open it up in terms of looking at maybe the, where the budget amounts were going to be, um, kind of where you were thinking 2020 was going to be um, versus where it actually ended up um, on, on some levels. Um, you know, so it really just kind of, it seems like they, they are expanding on that. Um, I know there's been kind of questions out there and people also thinking that there might be some refinement. We've already extended the first reporting deadline for PRF. You know, it was supposed to be yesterday and now it's all the way to the end of, of July. Um, so I, I still think, you know, there's, there's a lot more out there in terms of what's the eventual, where we're going to, going to land on, on, uh, this lost revenue concept, um, per se, but, um, I, I do think they are trying to, you know, figure out a way. I, it really boils down to at the end of the day, I don't think they're expecting or wanting agencies really to go ahead and have to be paying this funds back, right? They're, they're going to try and find a way for you to hopefully keep the money. Cause that's kind of the last thing the government needs to be dealing with. Um, so. I would think that yeah, if, if if the actual is kind of not where you were expecting to come in, does the budget paint a clearer clearer picture? All right. And then the last question that came in for the day was for June 30th, 2020 audit reports that had PRF received in April 
or May 2020 and incurred some incremental COVID costs and lost revenues from receipt date to 63020. What needs to be reported on the 630 CFA? So, yep. So none of none of the PRF funding gets reported on the 63020 CFA. All this reporting requirements started as of the 1231 calendar ring um, CFA. So so nothing to report um, for that. Just figuring that you know that funding was just kind of starting to, to trickle in in places and and really was just waiting on the the kind of final addendum to come out, which wasn't issued all the way until December. Um, and figuring most entities were going to try and hopefully have audits either wrapped up or very close to wrapping up at that stage. Um, so basically, that those numbers for the PRF were actually kind of exempted from reporting on the 63020 CFA. It's really kind of a going forward um, item. So, right. so the answer would be nothing. <laughs> there you go. All right, and then often the answer. <laughs> right. All righty. So that was the end of the questions that came through. Um, so I'll toss it back to you guys as the presenters if you have any other final words to wrap up the webinar for the day. Nope, I, I think uh, you, you said best, Ashley. If anyone has any um, additional questions or just want to dive deeper into any of the topics we brought up today, please. Feel free to reach out to either uh, Jenna or myself. You know, we have our contact info um, there listed, and um, hopefully, everyone gained a little bit something from this. If you have had a single audit in the past, or if you've never had one, hopefully, uh, you're not panicking um, with the thought of maybe having to, to enter one. Yep, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Great. Yes, thanks everybody for joining. The handouts are attached and they're downloadable to you, and we will be sharing a follow up email after. The webinar concludes later in the afternoon. So everybody stay safe. Um, please complete the survey when we close out and have a great rest of your day. Thanks everybody.